Well, good morning, church. You all look ready for the holiday, which I hear is where the most of the church is. <laughs> Welcome to God's house. Thank you for the special privilege again of being on this pulpit. It's been such a joy to get and connect with the different ones of you. I got to meet Catherine without a mask today, praise Jesus. Yeah, no, you I know without a mask. So I hope to get the, to meet the rest of you without masks. Um, just so that one day when there are no masks, I get to know who you are. <laughs> um, one of the joys of the last week, uh, my, my family and I listened to uh, the sermon that Anthony preached. And actually, it was the boys and I driving home from school. And my boys were very sort of taken without the whole idea of forgiving people. And so I said, guys, before dinner today, please just go and write who you are forgiving and it needs to be someone who did something recently. So my younger one said, Mom, you do something every single day. So right now I forgive you. So I don't know how many people you actually did forgive or some. The Holy Spirit allowed you to recollect somebody who has held you back over the years. I'd love to hear those testimonies because there's power when the Spirit of God allows for us to walk in liberty. And one of the things that we are learning is that this is something that is very important and unlock so many things that the enemy locks up for us in the promises and the destiny God has assigned for us. So Anthony has written this book and I've read it. I've gone through it. I've underlined it. This is not my copy, but this is, a, I was just bringing it so you know it's available for you to read. One of the things that I have loved about it is that it gives you opportunity to reflect, okay, to write down some of your thoughts. Like he has problem reflections, um, what are your main emotional pain points? What, what bitterness are you nursing at the root of your pain, etc.? And so by the time you're done with this, you almost literally need to burn it because it's done. Because it allows for you to release the pain of unfor that unforgiveness brings to us. So I encourage you to please just get a copy. Um, particularly because of the conversation we are going to have this morning out of scripture. Um, but as a, a place of recapturing what we talked about last week, there are several things for me that stood out. And the main one was debunking the myths of forgiveness. All right? I remember seven of them, and I'm going to share real quick about what forgiveness really is. Forgiveness is not giving favor to the person who has wronged you. It's not for them. It's for, it's for me. And if you guys have, and I, I'm assuming many of you have done, have gone through um, plug-in, we had that one opportunity. Remember when you wrote down the names of the people who have hurt us and we've, have, have held us back and we've carried over the years, they were dead, et cetera, et cetera, and we burnt them. Some of us went into that fire and collected that ash and we reformatted the names and put those in our pockets. But then through life, it's, I have found that it's a discipline I need to take on. on the, in the book, Anthony talks about forgiving everyone of everything all the time. It helps you travel light. Forgiveness is not necessarily having conversations with the offender. I think for a long time we tied forgiveness to reconciliation. And those are very important, two very important things. But in the context of forgiveness, when, when God says, leave what is at the altar and go on to and forgive your brother, that is forgiveness. But in the other places when he says, don't hold back the grudge or the bitterness or the resentment, some of those places don't need conversation. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean forgetting the offense. There are many of us who are listening and who are here this morning who have carried deep scars from deep wounds. And whereas you have forgiven, it just means that God and he, the Holy Spirit will have to deal with the pain that has come from those broken relationships and circumstances. That forgiveness is not, is not a weakness Actually, in my reading this week, I realized that strong people are the ones who forgive because I have the power to say no to this thing that I have carried for so long. That forgiveness is not a feeling, it's an attitude, it's a purpose, it's an act. And forgiveness is not denying the offense. Like Anthony said last week, this conversation on forgiveness is actually very weighty and there are places and people who have been wounded and hurt, and we can't dismiss that as a light subject. And so even as I bring God's word to us this morning, I, want, I don't want to wrestle with this 
from a place of, of, cavalier, of just dismissal or, or thinking that the trauma that different ones of us have experienced is something you can resolve overnight. Some of us have, have suffered deep betrayal of divorce, um, of separation. Some of us have been abandoned as children or we have been abused as we were growing up. There could be some of us sitting here or listening to this that have been raped or sexually exploited. Those are deep wounds. You have been unloved or betrayed or been falsely accused. You have been ignored physically or you have been emotionally abused and I don't want or intend for a minute to make light of these situations. And yet this is what God has promised us in his word. Second Peter 1, 3 to 4 says, his divine power, his divine power, not us, his divine power has given us everything, every single thing we need for life, for godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. And that through these things, he has given us very great and precious promises that he will release us from the wounds. He will heal our pain. He will restore what the enemy has stolen. He will fill back our cup, pressed down, shaken, and running over so that we may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil. His power that is at work through us. And what he's asking for us to do is to release. Many of us, because of the pain of the past trauma and experiences, still hang on. Like if you, you know, when children are two or three at that point of mind, 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 to get a toy from their hand that they have clutched like this, you almost have to bring a muscle man, okay? Because they hold tight. But God is saying to us, give it to me. Give it to me and see what I will do with this. Trust me with the pain but do your part in forgiving. In church, we forgive because we have been forgiven. That there is no greater truth or power of the grace that we receive when we forgive, more than the death of our Savior on the cross. If we pause and contemplate on what that has meant for us, undeserving as we were, dead in our sins as we were, and reconciled to the Father as we were, that we didn't even ask, he took it upon himself to grant us forgiveness, then what we can do in receiving this forgiveness and giving it to others is an act of obedience. We forgive because God has asked us to. But forgiveness, even as it's critical to our salvation, cannot be fully experienced until you have experienced God's forgiveness in your life. I don't know how many of you come to church every Sunday or listening to this, who have never ever fully surrendered their lives to the Lord. You don't know the power of a forgiven life, the freedom that comes in knowing that I am not condemned because there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I can tell you if you are wrestling with forgiving others, perhaps you yourself have, you have not fully received or haven't reckoned with what forgiveness from our God means. And so this morning, allow that I will pray for us and invite for anyone here who has not made the, power, the prayer of salvation or surrendered their lives to the Lord to do that, even as we start our time of reflection in God's word. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is life for us. I thank you that it comes into dark spaces and brings light. I thank you that it comes into places of pain and brings healing. I thank you that it comes into places of separation and brings unity. I thank you that your word allows for us to see with eyes what it is we cannot see in our heart. I thank you that your word allows for us to reconcile with you. Father, may it be that if there is anyone here this morning who's listening to this, who has not made a personal decision to surrender their lives to you and know the power of forgiveness from you, oh Lord, won't you give them the opportunity to be convicted of sin of righteousness and of judgment. And to know that you are not condemning them, you're giving them the power to be loved into freedom. Are you here this morning or listening to me and just need to pray this prayer? I'm going to ask that we pray together even as we release ourselves to the Lord. Our Father, this morning, I recognize that I'm a sinner. 
I thank you that you have chosen to forgive me. I recognize that I'm undeserving. I thank you that you have reached out to forgive me. Lord, won't you take the wounds of the past where I have not considered you as an authority? Won't you take the wounds of my past where I have doubted you? Won't you take the wounds of the past that have been reflected in my relationships? Won't you allow that today I will be reconciled with you? I recognize that this day I'm a child of the living God. I have received salvation from you. I am free and free indeed. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin I received today. And thank you for the power that I will walk through life in the resurrected power of our Lord Jesus, in whose name I pray. Lord, I pray that the word that we shared this morning would find fertile soil. That, Lord, the words of my mouth, the words of my um, reflection would be acceptable to you. I pray that all of us would walk away deeply convicted about the things that we have held back, may have been holding us back, not just for ourselves, but those who are connected with us. There is power in the name of Jesus. I receive that you have forgiven us and you have given us all we need even as we purpose forgiveness for others and for ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, my husband Patrick and I have been married for 21 years. And <laughs> in those 21 years, I have understood the power of forgiveness in ways I never thought possible. Okay? I mean, I always thought he first needed to say sorry he needed to buy me flowers. He needed to show by his attitude. I have learned that that is not really so. I have learned the power of forgiveness as a parent. That my children wrong me intentionally and intentionally. We had this conversation that night after we were looking at our lists. And that I, because as a parent, I never, my parents, I don't know about you guys, but I never saw my parents first off ask each other for forgiveness. So I didn't see that by example. They always made us say sorry to them, sorry to our siblings, sorry to everybody. But we never saw grown-ups do it. So of course we carried that baggage into all our relationships. And um, I realized that I, I had struggled for a while to say sorry to my children. That to asking for forgiveness from a child that I had sort of brought into this world didn't augur very well. I, I thought, you know, I'm the authority here. But I've learned that there is power in those things. And it releases an amazing relationship between us when I came to that place. And so I have learned to forgive everything and forgive all the time. And as someone said, every good marriage is made up of two good forgivers. I have learned that every good parent-child relationship is also made up of two forgivers. Generally, life is about forgiving and granting forgiveness. Now, I don't know how many of you have been tracking with the trends of the last year or so. Or actually, I started earlier because when I was looking at these stories, some of the, the whole trend began to escalate in 2018, 2019 in our nation when suddenly the numbers of domestic situations in our country became more volatile and more intense. Or maybe it has always been there and suddenly it came to light. Every time I lived in the US um, for a while, and every time there would be um, a couple who had gone to hitchhiking and suddenly one of them comes back home and the other one is missing. We always knew who did that, okay? Or uh, a boyfriend or a fiancé who was with their fiancé, uh, fiancé, 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 one of them, they'd f fight and something would go wrong and then they'd decide. I mean, there was always, and I just thought this must be a Western thing until it's become a trend in the family situations around us where we hear of a wife who has killed her husband and has put him in a septic tank, where in January of this year, two teenagers were held over the murder of five family members, where Major Peter Mugure, who, who was age 34, was accused of killing his wife, Joyce Siombua, and his two children, Shanice, who was 10, and Prince, who was seven, and then proceeding to bury them in a grave in the Ngetu area. October 2019, 45-year-old Charles Morioki, who killed his lover's 11-year-old son, 
after they fell out. Then he buried the innocent child in Ragati Forest, only to reveal his evil acts after the police apprehended him. Of a 26-year-old husband who lit up his wife and watched as she burnt. And the only way they knew who it was is that she shared of who um, injured her before she succumbed to her injuries. August 2020, in Miringine village in Yandarwa, a 30-year-old father stabbed his two sons and then committed suicide. A man in August of this year hacking his two children aged six and four to death after quarreling with his wife over maize flour. In July, we heard of a 32-year-old woman who, was ha who hacked her husband to death with an ax, strangled her two children aged 14 and three before she killed herself in Thome. I read those stories and there were many more that really overwhelmed me. And somehow the conviction of forgiveness became stronger. That these were feelings and emotions that had taken off and the enemy had used in the most profound of ways. The most evil of acts. And of course, as you're sitting there, you're saying, yeah, that's, that's extreme, that's to the next level. And yet, is it? You cannot afford not to forgive. You cannot reach your destiny until you release bitterness and resentment in your life because of what unforgiveness has brought. Because the other side of forgiveness is freedom and blessings. In this same book, one of the things Anthony says is that forgiveness is a mindset. Actually, that's the title of the book. But if I was to put another side title, I'd call it Getting Out of the Unforgiveness Stronghold. Okay? And what is a stronghold? I'll describe a stronghold as a mindset, a state of being, a value system, a thought process that grows to a place until it hinders your growth, your transformation, and a place to live a fulfilled life. It is a stubborn disposition. It is an accusation that has been planted in our minds by Satan. An author says that most of us think of, of strongholds as bondages, the things that we know, sexual trespasses, drug addictions, alcoholism, outward sins that are always on this worst sin list. But when you begin to doubt God's power, to do good, to release you, from a situation of unforgiveness, the power that it has over you, and not just over you, but over your family, over those who are around you, to an extent that what we have just had becomes a reality, that cannot be anything but a stronghold. God has intended that you release so that this power is broken in your life. And it is just not a power broken in your own life, it is a power because of who you are as a child of God that allows for other things to turn around in your family situation. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But that is a promise God has given me because of my faith. That I can take up on that promise and say, for me and my house, because of my forgiving, the things that have been our past that, of, that have been bred out of unforgiveness will be broken in Jesus' name. Because you see 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, we live in a world and we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient in Christ. I don't know how many men here have gone through the man enough amazing um, 10, 10, 12 weeks of money. Now, how many have? How many of you have? One, two. Amazing, amazing. Okay. So you, I'm hoping, know that you're still a priest, that you're still a provider, that you're still a... There are many Ps. What are the other Ps? A protector, that you're still a... That you still need to go back to money enough and rewind... Now, let me tell you a story on the first, like, two or three seasons after they had come out. One Sunday, and we were on Gong Road at that point in time, a group of women, no, they didn't accost me. They sort of called me into a, 
caucus, okay? And they said, listen, Pastor Faith, this money, nothing has to stop. So I said, but I'm hearing amazing testimonies from the pulpit of men who have been transformed, who have come to the saving knowledge of our Lord, who are once dependent on alcohol, and now, you know, something has turned around, have been delivered of, you know, all the chains of father wounds and all the, you know, that power, power of forgiveness is at work in their life. So what do you mean? And these women said, listen, when those, women, those men come out of the last camp and come home, they want us to pretend that nothing happened that they left two days ago. <laughs> they left us with no money for food. They left us with bills. They don't remember what they did a month ago when they didn't come home. They forgot that they have been, I mean, and the women were like, what are we supposed to do with these men who are supposed to be new? And then they feel bad that we are the ones who have been praying for them to change. And now that they have changed and we've come home and they want to restart, we are, I mean, we are not ready. There has to be something else we might do so that you can bridge this thing. Now, they need a woman in, I actually, that was my thought. Someone is laughing like they were in that conversation. But do you see where I'm coming from with this thing? I mean, it's a dynamic that's powerful. That I forgive and then still we didn't finish things here. So what am I supposed to do with this whole thing? How do I forgive when I haven't been asked for forgiveness? So what is unforgiveness? Unforgiveness is a state of emotional and mental distress, anguish, agony, that comes from a delayed response in forgiving an offender. It is characterized by indignation, by bitterness, a demand for punishment, for justice, for restitution. And forgiveness creates a domino effect that negatively impacts every part of us, like we had last week. Emotionally, that's where we think we are wrestling yet. It manifests itself in physical unwellness, in mental anguish, in pain that we have never seen before. In our relationships, we become a particular kind of person. That when people see us coming over there, they know I'm, ab they are ab I'm about to say something that is negative out of my own pain of unforgiveness. Here's the thing about carrying unforgiveness. When you nurse a grudge, it is the one thing that does not get better with nursing. Actually, it grows and becomes a resentment and a wound that worsens and infects even more the rest of your life. It's carrying around a huge weight, a grudge that is heavy. And in the absence of a timely response, the roots of unforgiveness only go deeper, further entangling us. And like Nelson Mandela said, I found out that this was his quote, hating somebody is drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. This morning, I want us to talk about what unforgiveness does to relationships around you. And to help me understand, uh, help us all understand the impact of this, I want us to share from Joseph's story. Now, it's a long story because Joseph's story starts from Genesis chapter 37. And the, uh, one of the most profound um, places of jo Joseph's journey are all the places of hurt and wounding that he went through, okay? There was just something special about all the phases of healing and brokenness that came out of his life. Because I want to tell you for free, that the people who we love the most many times are the ones who hurt us the most. So Genesis 37 begins by saying, oh, before I, I, I begin there, Joseph's father was Jacob. Okay, if you remember that, just to give you a little backstory. And Jacob's brother was Esau. Now, if you remember, Esau stole Jacob's birthright by pretending to be Jacob, okay? So he went and he, and he put on um, sheep, something or other, and got his blessing from his blind father. And that was Esau who did that. And Jacob comes back and finds that his birthright has been taken away. So when I began reading this story again, I thought, I wonder if he had released his brother from that very intense situation before he started having his own children and what if Jacob's story translates from that space? This is just me wondering. Um, because like we'll find out, there's just a lot that you bring in 
into your family situation of unforgiveness um, that is unresolved, that is passed on to ne next generations. So Genesis um, 39, it's a long story. I'll keep skipping and just reading out the important part. It says Jacob lived in the land where his father stayed. And this is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers and the sons of, of Bilhan, sons of Zilpha, his father's wife. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Okay. Now, Israel, who was also Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he had been born in his old age. And so he made an ornate, what they call a beautiful robe for him. And when his brothers saw that their father loved J uh, Joseph more than any of them, they hated him and they couldn't speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and he told his brothers and they hated him all the more. And they said, listen, he said to them, listen to this dream I had were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose, stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around me, uh, mine, and bowed to it. And his brother said, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he said to his brothers, listen, <laughs> he was really, he just didn't get it. I mean, like, really? So he tells his brothers, this time, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, even his father rebuked him and said, Ah, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in the mind. So, just to rephrase, so far, Joseph is the favorite child, and he knows because, how does he know? He goes and tells his father everything that the brothers have done. The father listens. He treats him as a favorite. There are dynamics in this family relationship that are getting into the negative. There are feelings that are of bitterness and hatred that are beginning to brew. And so one day, the brothers have gone to graze their father's sheep. And he goes out to look for them because his father had sent him. And Joseph, uh, in verse 17, it says at the end, so Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan, but they saw him in the distance before he reached them, and they plotted to kill him. Here comes a dreamer. Uh -huh, come. Come and tell us what the latest dream is. But they purpose, let's kill him. Let's throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. And then we'll see what comes out of his dreams. One of the brothers called Reuben said, no, let's not do that. Let's not shed blood. Let's just throw him into this cistern in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. When Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, and they took him and threw him in a cistern. It was empty. And just as they were looking out there, the, there was a caravan that came along. And there were Midianite merchants in verse um, 28. And it says his brothers pulled Joseph out, sold him from, for 20 shekels, and off he went into the land of Egypt as a slave. And the brothers went back to Jacob, and they had slaughtered a goat and poured it over this robe that Jacob really liked. And he recognized it in that verse 33, and he said, it's my son's robe. Some ferocious animal have, has devoured him. Surely he has been torn to pieces. Verse 34 is important. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on a sackcloth, mourned his son for many days. And his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Now imagine this was your family situation and the dynamic of the favorite child, that even your father is not willing to get out of mourning, to pay attention, or a, a bit of sort of balance the scales for all of you because he had a favorite child. In chapter 39, Joseph has gone off to Egypt um, he has been forwarded to Potiphar, who was an Egyptian. Um, as he's in Potiphar's house, because in verse 6 it says, Joseph was well built and handsome. <laughs> and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. And he refused. And uh, he, he said, no one is greater in this house. This is the wife saying. No, sorry, this is Joseph saying. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against you? And then in verse 13, the wife set 
him up after he had kept pleading over and over again. And what he did is that he took his cloak in her hands and ran out of the house and said to the servants, look, this Hebrew has been brought um, to make a spot of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. He had me scream. He left his cloak and ran out. And Joseph was put in prison for false accusation. Now, at that point in time, how many people is Joseph forgiving? Okay, are we counting? Let's just continue. So he went into the prison, and in there, in chapter 40, he finds others were in prison. There's a cupbearer and a baker, and somehow that gift of dreams is actually real because Joseph begins to interpret their dreams. And one of the dreams was that one of them would be successful and be given favorable inter, um, a, a favorable place in the, in, the, in the kingdom, and the other one was going to die. The cup bearer was the one who was going to be released from jail, and he was going to grant, be granted favor. And he told Joseph, because you've done this for me, I will never forget you, never. In fact, as I leave, tomorrow you'll be released from this jail. Chapter 41, two years passed. <laughs> He's still in jail. The cup bearer, meanwhile, is in the courts of Pharaoh. So the Pharaoh has a dream. The cup bearer, who is in Pharaoh's court, two years later has forgotten that Joseph, he had committed to Joseph. Um, is, here's the, the Pharaoh talking about this dream, and no one can interpret it. But then he remembers, oh, there was a guy who was in jail with me another time. Maybe if we bring him out, he'd be able to do that for us and, and, and perhaps tell us what this dream is about. And so Joseph is brought out, and he translates the dream as being years of plenty and years of lack. And Pharaoh is so impressed that he gives Joseph a promotion and says, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are, Pharaoh to Joseph. And you shall be in charge of my palace, all my people who are... Um, to submit to your orders, only with respect to the throne will I be greater to you. So Joseph, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. He took his ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger and dressed him in linen. And he said to him, um, you are in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Okay? So I wonder if he looked at the Kabera at that point and said, eh, you forgot me. Here I am. Okay, the story goes on and he begins to work strategically in the Egyptian space and begins to um, put away what they needed in, when the years of luck came. And uh, when the years of luck actually do kick in, many lands and many tribes around them begin to lack for food. And what they do because they hear that Egypt has food, they start coming to Egypt and buying. Jacob begins to hear that there is food in the land of Egypt where they did not have food and sends his children. And when they send his sons, they find Joseph. So it is said that the years between Joseph being sold off as a slave to his brothers coming into the presence of Joseph as the one who was heading this whole food campaign was 22 years. So for 22 years, he had not seen his brothers. For 22 years, he could have been festering, feeling a particular way, but we won't know until we continue with the story. So he recognizes his brothers, they don't recognize him. And he says, you're spies, you have come to see what our land, uh, that, to see here that our land is unprotected. And they said, no, sir, we've come as servants to buy food. And all, we are all the sons of one man. Your servants here are honest men, they are not spies. And to, just to hurry up this story, on the third day, because he keeps them for three days, Joseph says to his brothers, do this and you will live. Because he keeps saying, you guys are spies. And they're like, no, you're not spies. So he says, do this. If you're honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison where the rest of you go and, and take grain to your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother um, so that the words that may, may be verified and you may not die. And they say to each other, surely we are being punished because of Joseph. Okay? They're tying their misfortune, and rightly so, to the situation that happened 22 years prior. They had sent their brother to death. They didn't know if he was alive or, de or dead. And now they're saying, we are in trouble. We are in serious trouble in a foreign land. Could it be because of what we did to our brother? 
They say we saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life and we wouldn't listen. That's why his distress has come upon us. Reuben, the older one, replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against that boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. And they did not realize that Joseph could understand them. This is what Joseph did when he heard that. Verse 24, he turned away from them and began to weep. His heart was broken for his brothers. And then he came back and spoke to them and he said, oh, sorry, he came back and spoke to them again and he had Simon, one of the brothers, taken from them and bound in front of them. Now this was because he told them, before I release him, you have to bring the youngest in your family, in your, in your father's household. He needed to see his youngest brother, Benjamin. Long story short, they go away and, um, and they have to bring Benjamin with him. And so Jacob says, but how can we, I send my youngest son, I've already lost one. And you're telling me to send, give you my youngest son to another land. How is this even possible? So they haggle, they back and forth and they take Benjamin back. But as they are leaving, um, silver and uh, some very important silverware and gold is planted in their sacks and then now they're in trouble the second time. And Joseph says to them, you have to leave this one now behind. And now they're in trouble. They're in real trouble because how do they negotiate with this man who is sen next, senior next to the Pharaoh to go back and tell their father that once again, they have lost a second child, a second son of their father. To cut this long story short in chapter 45, Joseph makes himself known to his brothers. But can you imagine the conflict of emotions that comes with that space. First, are they happy that he's alive or are they angry that they have, he has punished them like this? Are they happy that they can go and tell their father? I mean, I can't imagine the setup of that family reunion. It must have been so intense. But what, what Joseph does is that he weeps loudly in front of his brothers. And he says, come close to me. And when they had done so, he says, I'm your brother. Do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land and for the next five, there will be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and save your lives by great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of the, over the entire ruler. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the uh, region of Goshen. Be near to me. You and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all that you have, I will provide for you there because for the famine is about to come. They go and they do bring their father back with them to the land of Egypt. And Jacob says, I am the God, and Joseph says to, uh, and Jacob says to, and God says to Jacob in a vision at night, he says, before he left, I am God, the God of your father, says the Lord. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, says the Lord. I will surely bring you back again, and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Joseph's act of release relocated his family from deep despair to plenty. The story of Joseph just reads like one of those Netflix series. You know, season one, season two, season three, and like, is there nothing good that will come out of this? And somebody said, in the shadow of my heart and pain, forgiveness sometimes feels like a decision to reward my enemy. But in the shadow of the cross, Forgiveness is a gift from one undeserving soul to another. If there's someone in scripture whose journey of life caused great pain, was caused, uh, his uh, life had many people cause him great pain, betrayal, perhaps death, potential death, um, pain of being forgotten, pain of being a false accusation towards Joseph's life. And forgiveness is not the whole process. It is a catalyst of healing of relationships. It's an act that is never earned by the recipient, but it allows for you to find favor. 
in a way that is inexplicable. Joseph forgave his brothers. Joseph forgave Potiphar's wife. Joseph forgave the cup bearer. Joseph forgave many others because I think Joseph had made it a habit and a purpose for him to release before the Lord. He understood that that is what opened up doors of favor in his life. Who would explain how a foreigner would find a place in a foreign land, a second only to the king, except that God ushers you into these spaces because you have chosen to release that that has held you in your past. I marvel at the numbers of inheritance cases in our courts today. Many of us have seen some of those, and it's children born of the same mother and the same father, perhaps not, but of the same, I mean, you have the same son name, who have wrestled with releasing and forgiving one another. And so they don't even have the joy of experiencing the inheritance they have been left because they are wrestling with this. Joseph's brother held a deep grudge against Joseph for being the favorite child. It, it may be that Joseph contributed to that because, of course, he was the snitch, because he knew he was favorite, da 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 da, all those things that you know are family situations. But they could have chosen differently. They could have chosen to make a different choice of their emotions because no one chooses for you to become angry or bitter or resentful. You make that choice yourself. Because the brothers could not forgive, they discussed the act of killing their brothers many times over. And I'm sure it affected their own dynamics, their relationships one in another. I'm sure there was mistrust that, brewed, that begin, began to brew um, amongst themselves. I'm not sure they even trusted you know, having their children in each other's homes because who knows what my brother can do with my child if he could be, we could be part of killing our own brother. I wonder if Jacob ever forgave his sons for what had happened to Joseph. Genesis 37, 34 says, when, Joseph, when Jacob heard, he tore his clothes and mourned his son for many days. And all his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. I will mourn until I join my son in the grave. He had locked another door that may have been a potential place of grace and favor for his family. Joseph forgave and allowed God to usher him into his destinies many times over. One of the things that happened when Jacob um, was dying at the end, actually when he died in Genesis 50, is that Joseph's brothers panicked. And he says in verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge? What if he wants to repay us in full for all the harm we did to him? And so they sent word to Joseph saying, your father gave these instructions before he died. Tell Joseph this, please forgive. This is him now. They're trying to play their father as proxy. Tell Joseph this, please forgive the sin of, sins of your brothers and the wrong they did when they treated you so badly. Now please forgive the sin of the servants of God, your, the, the sin of the servants of the God of your father. When this message was reported to him, Joseph wept. Then his brothers also came and threw themselves down before him. And they said, here we are. We are your slaves. But Joseph answered and said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant me harm. But God intended it for a good purpose. So he could preserve the lives of many people, as you can see this day. So now don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your little children. Then he consoled them and spoke kindly to them. <clears throat> Verse 22 of chapter 50 said, Joseph lived in, lived in Egypt along with his father's family for 110 years. The journey and account of a man who made it a habit to forgive. Now, one of the things that I want us to reflect on this morning is a power and forgiveness in our own family situations. And I do know if you're from a family like mine, that we have aunties who don't talk to us, and we have uncles who have been estranged from the family, et cetera, et cetera. And I was preparing this message, I thought, I wonder what kind of blessings have been held back or we haven't received as a family because we are living in disunity, because we are not reconciled one with another, because we have chosen not to forgive. Is there a place as one who confesses 
the power of God in my life, who knows the power of forgiveness, to begin to reach out to my family members and to say, can we forgive first? Because that is my personal choice. And then out of forgiveness and as we listen to the Holy Spirit, can we begin to work on reconciliation? Because as we have seen in Joseph's life, the blessings that came to him out of his choice to forgive were also his, his blessings for his, um, not just um, his siblings, but also his father's blessings. And then the generations that came after him. I have done five things as I've reflected on this and I want to share them with you. One, I've begun to map out the strongholds that have been in our family setting due to unforgiveness. I have found out that there are many people who have passed on that some of my aunties and relatives are holding on to. Some of the things that they confess as curses, but mainly because it has been a situation of unforgiveness. I began to ask God to give me discernment on those strongholds, even as I map out my family setting, that we can begin to break them. And not just for myself or for my family right now, but for the generations of those who are coming after us. Because God has given me the authority that as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Secondly, I began to ask my mom and her siblings, are there people who died that still hold you back? Okay, because our culture believes a lot in that. And as long as those things are still as, uh, 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 in presence in, in your life and hold you back, then you will never get a breakthrough. And I've begun to say, mom, can we begin to ask if we need to release them in forgiveness? Now, I need to go and sit down and explain this whole thing scripturally because it's, it's for, of course, it sounds a little foreign. But there needs to be even a release of those who have gone ahead of us that we are still holding on to. Number three, I begin to, began to ask the Lord to give me opportunity to call a family meeting where we can begin to talk openly about places we have hurt and wounded one another. And not just as siblings, I have a sister and two brothers, but also between my mother and I and, and us, between um, the cousins, we have tried to do family reunions that after two meetings go south and begin to ask, why is it we are not together in unity as a family? Is there something that we need to observe and ask God for a break? Number four, I've begun to ask that God would begin to grant us forgiveness of one another and the opportunity to ask it out verbally, to say, I'm sorry I hurt you in this way and for forgiveness to be granted back to me verbally, to speak it out. Remember last week, Anthony said, speak out the wounds and the pain and the hurt of the person who has wounded you. And in speaking them out, you nullify the power that they have heard over you. And I'm hoping that as we get together as a family, we can say, you know, I, I am sorry. Please forgive me. And forgiveness can be granted back. But fifth, I'm also asking that we can get into a prayer of agreement as a family over the things that have held us back that may have been caused by unforgiveness. That whatever it is that is an, a stronghold due to unforgiveness will be broken. That Lord, Lord in his mercy will restore. That he will even now bring bountiful blessings because we are choosing to walk in forgiveness. And that seeks that God would allow me to see us receive his blessings and promises to us as a family because those are what he has granted to us. That he will allow for me to see his goodness in the land of the living and not just for me and my household but for those who are part of my clan, who have been a part of this journey with us. And that we begin to unlock all the places where we can track, you know, trends that are for sure not of God. And through unforgiveness, we can grant a change and a turn in the blessings God has in store for us. Now, it may sound simplistic. I think for me, I'm asking for God to grant me an opportunity to see it with, with um, a bigger sense of discernment. But I'm choosing to also obey this quickening in my spirit that unforgiveness is a part of the things that we need to do in, as business, as a family. As I close our time, I want to share, and want actually to invite a special friend who has a story to share about family and forgiveness, her own life. Now, if you know me, you know I, I, I what do I say? I, I just love people who carry life light. I love everybody. I love, really, I do. But there's something about people. Do you, 
Do you ever meet people like those who just don't seem to bebana with, with baggage? There's a lightness in their spirit. Maybe they, they were born like that and they should give us out that, a bit of that. But there's a lightness in their spirit. When I, um, we first started meeting physically, it was just su such a nice place to begin to observe you, to begin to observe the different ones I had never met, who had never met. So I met Lynette the first time we met here for the first time. And I'm like, there's a thing about this mama that's light. She just laughs easily. Everything just looks like fun. And I, I was drawn to her lightedness. And a couple of weeks later, I said, Lynette, I want to drink tea. If you don't know me from Adam, but we get to know each other, um, let's just sit and, and sort of have conversation. And we had a four-hour coffee date. And I heard her story. And I kept asking her, so, OK, so, OK, so why are you like this? Why are you light in your life? Why is there a joy apart, just a seemingly part of how you go through life? What is it about you that is different? And I'm going to invite Lynette up on, on the pulpit. We've had this conversation for a while. I've said, please, you must share your story. You must bring it to home for us because there's just power in testimony, guys. And I, I, I'd love for you from this pulpit to, to get into that space where you share what God has done for you because it allows for us to know it is possible in my context. It can be done in my life. If God can do it for you, he can do it for me. So she just comes smiling like this, eh? This is what you have been missing because of masks. <laughs> so this is Lynette. Just tell us all your names and um, a bit about your, fam your, your family. Oh, you, okay. So good morning. I think it's, it's still afternoon. morning. It's no. almost. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So good morning, church. How are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see how she... <laughs> and just lightly correct me. <laughs> good, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lynette Owerokoth. I am born again and I love the Lord as my personal savior. He's my best friend. I am married to one Mr. Handsome, Mr. Amos Okoth, who also serves in the quest. And we are together, we have three children. Our first born is 18, our second born is 13, and our last born is six years old. So yeah. were you just born, like, this, just smiling, like, like just happy? Uh, if, if you met me, like, 20 years ago, I was a very sad girl, very sad girl. And it's because of the family that I grew up in. I, I was born in a very dysfunctional family, a home that was prevalent of um, alcohol abuse, domestic abuse. I am one who watched my mom really being battered by my dad. And of course, alongside that came the entire list that you read out. In fact, I was like, eh, separation, I am there. Sexual abuse, I am there. Oh, CG, eh, battery, domestic violence, I am there. You know, eh, children going in different ways, I am there. I mean, there was a long list of, of trauma that came along with being brought up in this home. So mm -hmm. I wasn't born like that. And before I knew it, I was not this smiley, you know, light-hearted girl. I mean, this has come with many things, but yes, I was very sad, you know, very sad, very traumatized, really holding back. And I think for me, the, the one thing that I have seen when people are going through issues, it's either that they, you know, freeze, you know, um, mm -hmm. when, when you're being faced with very difficult circumstances, uh, people freeze. And, mm -hmm. and for me, that was freezing for me meant self-doubt and meant going about my life with a lot of fear, you know? So, I, 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 and I could see men in authority and I would just shy away. I remember being in campus, I would just see a lecturer. Oh my gosh, that is a man. Oh my goodness, I would just go in the uh, opposite direction, you know? So a lot of fear. And then guys would be like, you're so gifted, you're talented. But I'd be like, hmm, really? You know, yet I had won so many uh, accolades growing up, you know? public speaking, acting, music, you know, but still there was a lot of doubt even amidst all those um, um, accolades. Mm. And then there is the flight. So for me, I think the flight. So there's those, you know, it's fight, flight, freeze. So I started with freeze and I've so shown how um, self-doubt and, and fear. Mm. And then there is the flight. For me, the flight was avoidance. And avoidance was avoiding alcohol altogether. Mm. So as a teen, Manze, I used to see alcohol. I'm like, that. that is what I have grown up with at home. So mm. I ran away from that. Yeah. Mm. So I totally avoided alcohol. Um, and then fight. Fight for me was, man, you don't joke with me, eh? as in anger, bitterness, to Taonana, you know, so don't don't mess around with me. Don't bring your things around here, shenanigans. So um, and and for me, uh, looking at people who I would see were always joyful. So my my whilst my 
instinct now is to smile and laugh. Then it was to frown and, you know, like look at people like, why are you happy? Suspicion. Yes, suspicion. Yeah. Wha wha and, and getting into marriage is what even mm. exposed this more. Because I went into this happy-go-lucky Okot's family and everyone is so peaceful, so joyful. I'm like, hmm, what is so good about, why, why is everyone just, w there are things to fight about in life. Eh? Why is there no domain? Why aren't people arguing, you know, struggling with issues? People are just like, how are you? How is everything? How is mom? I'm like, no, this is not life. This is <laughs> abnormal, you know? Uh, so for me, really um, fighting anger, bitterness, and, and going into a home, into a married, marriage uh, that people are very peaceful is really what made me realize there is something absolutely wrong with me and mm. I need to make the changes. Yeah. So you had an encounter with the Lord and yes. you surrendered your life um, in salvation. Yes. So something began to turn yes. in that space when that happened. Of course, that is it. I mean, um, looking, my, my in-laws are very, for them, Christ is the anchor of their home. And, and for me, looking at them and looking at my father-in-law who really embraced me and loved me, my mother-in-law, you know, these parents just took me as I am. And I remember going in there and I was like, man, disclaimer, issue number one, I come from a dysfunctional home. So if you're expecting, and then they were like, eh? Yani, this one is, has just <laughs> laid it all in the open. Eh? I, I didn't lie. I, I wasn't trying to be what I am not. And when I met Christ, you know when Christ says, who is in Christ is a new creation. Mm. And Christ came so that we may live life and have it more abundantly. Mm. You know, so I started mulling over these verses. And I was like, what does this mean? As in Christ came so that I may have life more abundantly. Mm. I am, I've been set free and I'm free indeed. Mm. So what are these freedoms that Christ is really talking about? And I think it comes with knowledge and understanding mm. and awareness that you know what, the old has gone and mm. the new has come. Mm. And it was up to me to decide, has the old really gone? Mm. Have you really forgiven? Because whilst my default then was to be a victim and bring over, I used to have dates with my past. So I would just go, <laughs> put all the things I've been through in my life, hapa, nilie, 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 you know, <laughs> then I'd be like, okay, I, I'm, I'm done with this, then I, I'm just feeling worse, mm. so it looks like I'm still harboring a lot. Mm. But now going into Christ, I'm like, I said, asking myself questions, are you really freely net? Are you, has the past gone? I mean, and remember, you're still going to face these people tomorrow, so what is that? What does that mean that if you've forgiven them, so are you going to start hugging them? Are you going to <laughs> love on them? And, and the second thing that I realized is, okay, Lynette, it's not about you. These people really hurt you because they are hurting themselves. Mm. And that gave me an opportunity to go back and, and start seeing, why did my dad or why are the people from my dad's family behaving the way they are behaving? Mm. So I started looking at my grandmother. Mm. And then I looked at my great-grandmother. You know, and I was like, Enyewe? Mm. I mean, those guys were, uh, there was a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, a mm. lot of abuse, mm. and, and it all now came back to my dad. And I asked myself, I have a choice mm. to either propagate that and advance that into my other generations, or I have a choice to stop, mm. you know? And, and when I realized, so the first thing, remember, was salvation, mm. and, and God giving me the awareness and knowledge. Mm. The second thing is, we all hurting people, hurt other people mm. and gave me a chance to look back and see where this heart is coming from. Mm. The third one is I have a choice. You know, I have a choice to propagate, advance, magnify or totally kill it and bury it. Mm. And for me, that is the one thing that I did. Mm. I, I said enough. I have to live happy and I have to, you know, just carry myself lightly. And when people are hurting other people, by the way, I excuse them. I have no qualms. Eh? Have me to, yeah. I have compassion. I'm like, Man, I know, maybe I don't understand the journey you've been through, but I know there's something in there that you need to deal with. Mm. And, and the last thing that I did is that I just gave myself permission to do me. Mm. You know, and that's why when I'm here on stage and I'm dancing and I'm laughing or I'm singing uh, or I'm with people, I've become a lover of life. I am mm. extremely passionate about life. I mean, anyone who interacts with me, this energy will rub onto you. And mm -hmm. it is because I, I know for sure I have totally been set free. Mm. And the funny thing is, whilst the default was to be sad and, you know, mal over my past, nowadays my default is I am extremely happy, extremely peaceful, extremely joyful. But when something happens and I'm in that restless space, I'm like, devil, get out of here. <laughs> you ain't got no space here, you know? <laughs> devil, get out of here. because and, and that's been my life. I have given myself mm. 
permission to do me. Mm -hmm. I have been set free. I am enjoying the freedom and the space that I am in. I am enjoying my family. I'm enjoying my marriage. I'm enjoying my friendships. I'm enjoying my neighbors. And one thing that has helped me, and I remember you asked me, have you been through therapy? For me, my therapy has been to surround myself with human beings who are very compassionate and who like Christ and we are just willing to share with each other. And this is my e-group. Mm. You'd be surprised. I have never been to therapy. Mm. I've never <laughs> gone for a counseling session. You know, I just did this with Christ. Mm. And then I have been surrounded with an e-group that we've been meeting for like 10 years now. And mm. the one thing is that they are more elderly, like five years plus uh, older than me. So I've, they've helped me to walk this journey. Mm. And, and even without knowing, because they just share their experiences, and the great learner I am with a sponge mind, I am there internalizing everything, reflecting upon everything. And here you are presented with a very free, loving, bubbly, light-hearted, extremely set free, you know, Christ being the center and anchor of everything I do, Lynette Owarokon. Can't say it better. Can't say it better. Church, please stand up. That we would end our time.